information about alcohol. And he's going to give us the results of a verticillium survey in red raspberry. All right, this has been a long time in coming. I am so pleased that there are some people out there. So, um, I'm going to be giving most of the results from the verticillium survey uh, that we did back in 2013 and 14. It took us a long time to get this figured out. Uh, we had a DNA-based assay for this, and we could not get it to work, and we could not get it to work. There was a lot of drop in supplies by suppliers that we needed to run the analyses, and most recently we got an expert in the lab who told us that the assay that we were running that was published by another scientist was completely and horribly wrong, which is why it wasn't working for us. So, after much ado, here we are. I have some results for you, and I am so pleased. This is Actually, I've been looking forward to giving this talk for a while, and I think I have some very interesting information for you today. I hope it blows a couple of your circuits, and that this is the best talk you see in this entire conference. So as I mentioned at the Phytophthora fungicide resistance uh, talk earlier this morning, this is a team effort. There is no way I can do this on my own. Much of the funding was provided by the Washington Red Raspberry Commission. However, Inga and I both chipped in some of our own research funds because um, as Lindsay Thiessen, the qPCR expert who came into our lab, pointed out, gee, what happens if you don't find any verticillium? That's going to be very boring and very sad for your growers. You have all these samples. Why don't you look at these samples and find out if Phytophthora is an issue for these growers from these samples you took and if nematodes are? So we did that. We looked at the top three pathogens that we know of, nematodes, Phytophthora and verticillium, and this will be the culmination of that. Uh, Chris Benedict was instrumental in finding fields to sample. He is the one who showed me where all the fields were for this study, and um, though we ended up sampling, I believe, 24 fields in all. A big thank you again to all of the red, red raspberry growers who participated. Thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me take dead and dying plants from your field. I loved them, it made my day, and it really helped us get some good results, or good answers for you. And everybody else on here, from Jeremiah Dung, Lindsay Thiessen, Brian Beck, Annie Davis, Kim Graham, Amy Peets, and Inga Zasada, they did all of the analyses for pathogens. My main role was to collect samples and to isolate, uh, do the isolations for the different fungi. But all of these other people were big help and also contributing analyses to this. So the outline is fairly simple. I'm going to start with a background on what verticillium is, and then we'll talk about this survey for verticillium in the field and what the results were, and I'll summarize everything at the end. Verticillium dolly is a soil-borne fungus. It has an absolutely huge host range. It infects so many vegetable species, tree species, it infects hundreds of plant species, of which red raspberry is but one. It is an amazing pathogen in that it survives for decades in the soil. It produces these structures called microsclerotia, which are these thick-walled uh, thick cells that are also melanized. That's the dark coloration that makes it very impermeable to environmental degradation. It's also resistant to chemicals. And so these things literally will be in your soil long term. There's no way to completely eliminate it from the soil. If we look at the information we have for red raspberry as a host, we've known for over a hundred years that red raspberry is a host for verticillium dolly. We've known that since 1912. We also know uh, there's suggestions in the literature that red raspberry is more resistant than black raspberry. Black raspberry is an utter dog in terms of being susceptible to this pathogen. You can almost show it a picture and it will die. Uh, we also know that when you inoculate red raspberries with verticillium that they do get sick and they do develop symptoms. One interesting thing that happened while I was poking around is I talked to Steve Koike and Mark Bolda, 
uh, in California, they do, University of California, they both do extension. Neither of them think verticillium is that big a deal in red raspberry uh, for California. And there are potentially a number of reasons for that, which I'm not going to get into. Uh, let's see what the results from Washington say first. So typical symptoms of verticillium in red raspberry uh, in this uh, range from chlorosis, scorch, stunting, wilting, and death. So on the left-hand side, we have non-inoculated meeker in this upper picture, and on the right-hand side, these four plants were all inoculated with verticillium. And you can see they're, they're smaller than the non-inoculated plants. They do develop wilting. They develop chlorosis, this yellowing down here, uh, scorch symptoms and wilting. These are symptoms that are very, very similar to Phytophthora root rot. And if you gave me a plant with these symptoms, I could not tell you whether it was Phytophthora root rot or verticillium wilt unless I isolated from it. And I don't think anybody else out there can do it based on symptoms alone. These symptoms are very typical of root pathogens. So the background to why are we doing this verticillium study came about in around 2012. There are a few reports out there of verticillium being isolated from some dying plants in several grower fields. And when they sent in soil samples to various diagnostic clinics, those clinics came back with analyses showing that verticillium was in the soil in various amounts. So that started off this chain of questioning. That coupled with the fact that these symptoms that we were seeing, this wilting, this scorch, this chlorosis, was happening in late summer. Most people were expecting that Phytophthora root rot symptoms come more in early summer, late spring, when that fruit is starting to form. And they weren't expecting these symptoms that we were seeing later in the year, like late September, where the primocanes are wilting. And we, you know, there was some thoughts that, hey, this is different than Phytophthora root rot, which seems to affect both floricanes and primocanes earlier in the year. This was affecting primocanes later in the year, they were wilting and dying, and often it was on sites that weren't known to have Phytophthora root rot or on sites that were very dry. As I mentioned earlier, Phytophthora loves wet sites. Some of these sites where these symptoms were developing were drier sites with a lot more sand, and so it was thought this probably isn't Phytophthora root rot. What if it's verticillium? And so there was this question, is verticillium in the industry Let's go to the question slide. The, the questions started to be, how widespread or is verticillium in the red raspberry industry? If it is, is it associated with disease? It is, is it associated with these late summer symptoms? And then there became this question of which method is best for determining whether, verticill whether you have verticillium. There are a couple methods out there. And so my goal was to test a couple of the most common methods and see how well they did at detecting verticillium. So starting in 2013 and going through 2014, uh, we sampled soil and plants from 24 fields all in Whatcom County in late summer. Within those 24 fields, we had 70 sites. 51 of those sites were disease sites. These were sites where at least five plants right next to each other showed disease to my eye, meaning that they weren't lush, they weren't green, they had wilting stems, they were chlorotic, they were stunted, one of those. So those would be sites that look more like this on the left. There's, that's not a happy looking field. Whereas the healthy sites were these lush, green, beautiful uh, sites where I did not see any disease symptoms at all. So simply separating out unhappy looking plants, sick plants from healthy plants. The two methods that we tested, one was a culture-based method where we put soil or plant tissue on into petri plates, and if we see verticillium grow out like I did from these tissues, we call that verticillium positive, and if we don't see verticillium come out, it's negative. The other is a DNA-based method called quantitative PCR, which I'm going to shorten to qPCR, and that is shown on the right-hand side. And one way of thinking of this is that if you think of this green line as a timeline running from uh, early to late, and this uh, vertical axis as the amount of verticillium, this is one set of samples here, 
And because it's detected early, there is more verticillium in that sample than a sample where there is less. It takes longer to detect it, so it takes a longer period of time. So this is showing a lot of verticillium with this sample and very little verticillium with that sample. Um, as mentioned, it would be sort of sad if we got to the end of all of this and all we had was verticillium data or we couldn't find verticillium at all. So we also looked at whether Phytophthora was present in, from all these samples. We also looked at nematodes, Pratolenchus penetrans. And just for 2013 only, I was isolating a lot of Fusarium and Alternaria from canes. So we wanted to see if that was related to anything. Um, in 2013, there's a little bit of change in how we sampled from 2013 to 2014. In 2013 and 14, both years, we were looking at drier sites with no history of Phytophthora root rot. In 2013, though, we were looking for late summer symptoms of chlorosis, scorch, and we really keyed in on wilting and dying plants. So if I didn't see plants that were actively wilting and dying in late summer, I didn't sample from that site. And this shows an example. Uh, here's primocanes dying in late summer. This one's chlorotic and starting to wilt. This is wilting. Same here. And when you go down to the base of those canes, you find these lesions. If you scrape away the outer bark, you see these lesions coming up. That's what I was isolating from to find out if there was Phytophthora or verticillium from those. 2014 comes along and I could not find a wilting plant to save me. So we changed sampling strategies and what we did then is we started looking at sites where the plants were stunted, they were a little off color, uh, replant sites where you would replant uh, raspberry and they just weren't growing, they weren't surviving. So we're looking at replant sites like that. We looked at what I call gappy rows, where just suddenly you're going along through a row and it just drops out. And so I was, instead of finding wilting plants, I was focusing on these sort of suboptimal sick looking sites for the disease sites. So finally results. This is 2013 only. And um, this is the percent plants from which these four pathogens were isolated from. So what we see is less than 10% of the plants that I sampled, and there were 90 plant samples in 2013, 7% of those I was able to isolate verticillium from. That's very, 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 very low. Compare that to Phytophthora, where almost a third of the plants that I isolated from had Phytophthora coming out. And then what was unusual was that Fusarium was coming up out from about 40% of those canes. Again, that's a, those lesions down at the bottom. And again, about a third with Alternaria. So my question then was, are these Fusarium and Alternaria species coming out of the canes? Are they pathogens? Inga and I and one of uh, the technicians, Megan, tried so hard to kill plants with these Fusarium and Alternaria isolates. We dumped Fusarium and Alternaria in the soil at astronomical amounts. It was almost like 50% inoculum, 50% soil. These plants, these are inoculated plants over here, they did not care. We mashed fungal cultures onto the leaves, we mashed them onto the canes, we wounded things, nothing was causing disease. So at that point we decided this Fusarium alternaria percent infection, this is not important to us at this time, we don't have energy to work on potential pathogens that aren't that we aren't able to get cause some to cause symptoms. So at this point, we're just focusing on verticillium and phytophthora. So I'm not talking about either of those two, Fusarium and Alternary again. So 2013, 2014, this is now for both years. And we're gonna look in this left-hand column first. Uh, I have everything divided up into disease type, uh, disease sites, healthy sites, and then there's the total at the bottom. For both years, I had 161 plant samples from the disease sites, and only six plant samples ever did I ever isolate verticillium dolly from. Compare that to the healthy site, I never isolated verticillium from a healthy site, that is good, but this is a low, low, low percentage to isolate verticillium from diseased looking plants. If we take that on a site, level, remember there are 51 sites, those six plants only came from three sites. 
So only 6% of the 51 sites was I ever able to successfully isolate verticillium. Again, nothing ever came out of a healthy site. So verticillium is rarely isolated from disease plants or disease sites during the study. Let's compare that to Phytophthora, where 43 of the 161 plants I was able to isolate Phytophthora. That is almost a third. I never isolated Phytophthora from healthy plants. And if we go on a site basis, those 43 plants came from 26 sites. That means 50% of those disease sites I was able to isolate Phytophthora. And again, nothing from healthy sites. So what this is telling me is that Phytophthora is commonly isolated from disease plants and disease sites, even in summer. The dogma is Phytophthora loves cool weather and you would never be able to easily isolate it in the summer. I am able to isolate it in the summer. It is causing disease in the summer. If we look at the soil results, this is plating results only. This is where I'm putting the soil into petri plates and seeing if verticillium grows out. If we look at the disease sites, we're looking at a, a um, site basis. I was only able to detect verticillium 11 out of fi at, out of, at 11 out of 51 sites, or about 22% of the sites. What's interesting here to me is that I was also able to detect verticillium in the soil at healthy sites, at four out of 20. Notice this percentage is the same. I am detecting verticillium equally in equal percentages from disease sites and from healthy sites. Doesn't matter what kind of site it is, I am able to find verticillium there. If we look at the qPCR results, uh, that's the DNA-based one, I'm able to detect from disease sites verticillium in 36 out of 48 disease samples. So 75% of the sites I can detect verticillium by qPCR. That 75% is way higher than 22%. That's telling me qPCR is detecting more frequently than plating and that verticillium is a little more sensitive in that way. And again, I am detecting in the healthy uh, row detecting verticillium from 75% of the healthy sites. So it doesn't matter whether the sites were diseased or not, I am still finding verticillium in equal percentages and the qPCR method is more sensitive. So another way of saying this is I'm equally likely to detect verticillium whether that site is diseased or whether it's healthy and that qPCR is detecting verticillium at more sites than plating is alone. If we look at Phytophthora, I don't have a plating method for Phytophthora, so we have to strictly use qPCR. Oh, and one thing I didn't mention, the 68, you'll notice that doesn't add up to 71. That's because three of these sites, we could not get qPCR to work. It happens, qPCR, sometimes there's just too many inhibitors in that soil, and this DNA-based method just doesn't work. So Phytophthora. Uh, there's a little bit different story here. I was able to detect Vitophthora by qPCR from the soil at 30 out of 48 sites. That's 63%. Compare that to the healthy sites where I was only able to detect it at 3 out of 20 sites, or 15%. So in, otherwise, in other words, I'm four times more likely to detect Vitophthora at a disease site than from a healthy site. That's telling me that Phytophthora is more important to the disease site than verticillium. If we look at nematode numbers, um, whether it's penetrans nematodes per gram of root or per 50 grams of soil, these numbers from disease sites, and this is an average population level from roots and an average population from soil, these numbers are almost the same. I'm detecting almost the exact same number of nematodes from disease sites as I am from healthy sites. It's the same per gram of soil. So for this study, again, it doesn't matter whether I'm in a disease site or a healthy site, I'm detecting almost the exact same number of nematodes. So populations are similar in disease sites to those at healthy sites. One final thing I want to show is a comparison of plating versus qPCR. So if we look at the population category, and this is in Propagules per gram, 
If you've heard of colony forming units, Propagules program is the exact same thing as colony forming units. I think it might also be the same as parts per million, but don't quote me on that. It's just a way of counting the amount of pathogen in the soil. So we can go anywhere from there is no pathogen in the soil up to there are over a hundred pieces of, of pathogen per gram of soil. And what we see is with plating, there are a few uh, well, there was one site where I was able to detect more than 100 propagules of verticillium per gram. That's very similar to what we detected with qPCR where there were two. If we look at moderate levels, these numbers are similar. They're relatively few that have a moderate number of verticillium by plating versus qPCR. And it's the same for low. There's relatively no numbers. Where things fall apart is plating cannot detect below than below one propagule per gram. There's no way that I can do that. It would take me 200 petri plates on a sample to detect less than a propagule per gram. I cannot afford to do that, and I don't have the time or labor resources to count 200 plates per sample. So anything below one propagule per gram, I can't detect with plating, so we call that a zero. So 56 of the sites were counted as zero because that's all I could detect. This is where qPCR shines. qPCR can easily, easily detect less than a propagule per gram. So it's essentially pulling these zeros and it's able to detect verticillium in those because it's that much more sensitive. What this is also showing me is that a lot of these sites have very, very, very low amounts of verticillium. That may be one reason that I'm not seeing a verticillium disease in these sites, because these numbers are so low, less than a propagule per gram, that maybe there is not infection in those sites. And it may be only these sites where you have high amounts of verticillium in the soil that you are seeing infection. I don't have data to support that yet, but that's where I'm starting to think. So qPCR is more sensitive than plating for detecting verticillium. So I want to summarize. Based on qPCR, yes indeed, I could have told you at this beginning, verticillium is common in red raspberry fields. However, only Phytophthora is associated with the disease sites. Verticillium, nematodes, pratolinchus, um, uh, Fusarium, and Alternaria, none of those in this study were associated with the disease sites. The important things that come out of this part is that Phytophthora can cause disease on drier sites. Phytophthora symptoms can appear in late summer. And so these symptoms, a lot of that late summer wilting and those lesions at the bottom, all of that, most of that actually was caused by Phytophthora. And I would expect if we had gone back to those sites earlier in the spring, I would have been more easily able to isolate Phytophthora at that time. And uh, finally, qPCR not plating is more sensitive for detecting verticillium. So based on this study, I really think the number one soil-borne problem for growers at this time is Phytophthora, given what I'm hearing from California on verticillium and what I've seen here. I'm just not seeing evidence that verticillium is the main cause of major disease right here. I'm not seeing it can't cause disease. Remember, at six, six plants did develop disease. There are some sites where it can cause disease. But given the amount of Phytophthora that I'm finding, I think Phytophthora is a far bigger problem for you than verticillium. So with that, I will open up the floor to questions. 15 minutes before the break. Can, can you have Phytophthora and Verticillium in the same plant? And were you finding Verticillium plants in fields that had Phytophthora? So the question was, can you find Verticillium and Phytophthora in the same plant? I, I would bet you can. I did not, but I did find Verticillium plants very commonly next to plants infected by Phytophthora. I would, I would not find it unusual to find a plant somewhere where that had both. Was any consideration given to soil what? 
Uh, no, we did not look specifically at soil type or soil pH. But we can go back and find out that information. No question. Um, I remember 2014 was a really wet year. Um, was there a difference in your detection rate between years? You know, your, your methods were slightly different, although it still drew upon your, you know, your experience identifying disease. Was there a difference? Um, I have not specifically looked at a difference, but I remember I did have the 2013 data analyzed before the 2014 data, and the percentages are very similar. I don't think there was an overall difference that I saw, but I would have to look in that a little more closely to see if there was a difference between 2013 and 14. Uh, Jerry, on Phytophthora, in-field diagnosis, if you will, how often should we expect to see the classic line of demarcation in phytophthora plants in your estimation can you explain what the classic line of demarcation is well with a with a brown reddish brown lesion oh. you know versus right next to the white uh root tissue if it's a freshly if it's a plant that's in the process of dying and it is fresh for me this is very, very common. It wasn't initially apparent to me, and, and frankly, verticillium looks very, very similar to this. But this is, this is pretty classic for what I was seeing for Phytophthora. I guess my question really is referring to uh, down in the root, right at the top where the root is still below the soil, by scraping off the, the skin of the, of the mm -hmm. root, you can see this very um, clear demarcation there on the root. I think you even had a, a slide up there that showed that part. This is on the cane itself. Right, right, right. And I think that was my previous presentation. Yes, uh, you often do see that line of demarcation because as that fungus, I'm using that term loosely, as that fungus starts growing up through, it's killing tissue. So it, there is that clear line. After that plant dies, though, it's all holds off and the whole thing will turn brown but early early on in early stages of infection yes you should be able to find that line but that's not to say that there can't be other pathogens that would cause very very similar similar symptoms you really have to isolate to determine which one it is because at this stage i wouldn't be able to tell you whether that was verticillium phytophthora or some other soil borne pathogen they all cause similar looking types of lesions. But at this point, it's only verticillium and phytophthora that you feel cause the symptomatic plants that we've seen. I think the number one problem is phytophthora, followed distantly by verticillium. And I, I honestly don't know what lesions look like caused by Pratolinchus, the, the nematode. They wouldn't be this big. No, no. They would never be this big. So, this one was above ground, but earlier at my previous talk, I showed one that was just uh, on the roots as it was going up towards the cane. Yes, the lesions definitely do appear on the roots. Yeah, you could, if this was higher up, uh, there are lesions that occur on the canes higher up from botrytis and other things. Oh, another cane blight. I don't have any experience with leptospira. Does it look similar? Kinda, so yeah. So uh, apparently keen blight looks similar to this. I think above ground diseases are gross, so. Are you publishing or do you have a poster available? I am publishing. I don't, I, I actually do have a poster that would be available that I could send you a PDF of. So if you give me your name and email or other information, I'd be more than happy to send you the PDF or and anybody else. So publishing will probably hopefully be within the next year.
Yay! So I think it's break time. It is definitely break time. Thank you all for coming. Um, as with the previous sessions, we have pesticide credits in the back under the Washington, Oregon, BC signs. Crop Advisor 